Misty, ultimately, as a defense attorney, was it a mistake to only have Jennifer Crumbly as a witness in her defense? So she's the one who really has to tell the story. She's the best witness to put on that stand. And of course, you take a risk whenever you put the defendant on the stand because it opens up other areas of inquiries and you subject yourself to cross-examination. But to your question, they did. The defense tried to compel Ethan Crumbly to take the stand. His lawyers intervened and said, no way, because he has an appeal coming with respect to his sentencing of life without parole when the crime was committed by a minor. So they were really handcuffed in that way that he would take the stand and only plead the fifth. The judge then said, there's no reason for him to take the stand if he's not going to be able to answer any questions. But you bring up such a critical point, and I think we will see it in the appeal, uh, and, and appeals are generally based on errors of law and things the judge should have let in or shouldn't have let in. And that's that one of the questions by the jury was, can we make an assumption based on evidence we did not see, specifically relating to how did Ethan get possession of the gun? They wanted to know how Ethan came into possession of that gun. That is critical. And the only person that can answer that question is Ethan Crumbly. So I do think the defense did what they needed to do. They tried to compel the testimony. The Fifth Amendment was always going to blockade that under this particular set of circumstances, but it did leave a gaping hole in the jury's mind. Now, again, lots of other evidence here. Laura brought up a great point. That text message, Ethan, don't do it. That was always a sticking point for me because even if it was a fear that he was committing suicide, it lends the belief that she knew something uh, was amiss with him prior to the incident. So a lot at play here. Yeah, there were certainly, I think any reasonable person listening to that testimony, there were some believability issues uh, with that specific part of her testimony. Um, Ariva, to you, so much of this, I think, centers around this trying to convince a jury. Of, I, I couldn't believe that my kid would do this. And of course, then that leads to the confirmation bias that that's what a parent is just going to confirm. I wonder if now this is now more incumbent on parents to hypothesis test the opposite, which is maybe my child could do this. And I really need to be looking at the risk factors and the red flags. Absolutely, Brianna. Th this case just raises so many issues. You have to start with the gun was a gift for Christmas. And remember, there was testimony that Jennifer was bragging on social media about buying this gun, about going to the shooting range, shooting with her son. So yes, parents need to be asking the question, why are you buying a kid that's obsessed with guns a gun? Why are you telling him when he says he gets caught for uh, searching for ammunition online, you tell him it's okay to do it basically, but don't get caught. So this mother was just doing and engaged in conduct that's really bizarre. Uh, and in this case, it's, being, it's been determined to be criminal uh, because of her gross negligence. There were just so many red flags in this case. Let's talk about the uh, what happened after they were charged themselves. We know they tried to escape conscious of, of guiltiness, guiltiness of consciousness when they were on the run. They were actually fleeing the state. They didn't show up at their own son's arraignment. So again, here you want us to think you were this very involved parent, this very caring parent, but when your son is facing this very serious situation, you are running from law enforcement. 